Hi everybody and welcome to the channel. I am Richard. Today I am going to bring you out on a little island where you are going to try to produce goods for the gods. And if you do not manage to give them what they want, well, all hell is gonna break loose and they are going to try to rock your world. Literally by volcanoes or tsunamis or whatever they're gonna throw at you. So you better make sure that you have the resources that you need to make them happy. But also try to protect your land from the conquistadors trying to take over your home. I'm going to show you Tindaya. This is a one to four player games. It's around 30 minutes of gameplay per player. This game is quite, quite advanced. There's a lot of things you can do in this game. There's a lot of different components and there's a lot of different ways of you to produce goods. You can do simple goods, you can do more complicated goods. And I'm going to show you an overview of this game. I'm going to show you the setup of the game and I'm going to go through the gameplay itself. So let's just have a look at it. This is the setup of the main board. You have eight big tiles with water, shasms and volcanoes. On one side the volcano and shasms are unactive, black, and on another side they are red, meaning they are active. Depending on how hard game you have, you can choose to have more or less red ones. The more red you have, the harder it gets but it should still be balanced so it doesn't get too hard or too easy. On the active sides you have shipwrecks that you can see lying in the bottom of the water. These should match up with the active volcanoes and not be next to each other. They should line up. To figure out how many terrain pieces you should put out on the board you need to look at the setup aid card. Here it says you should have 10 shores 12 forests and 8 mountains if you are 2 players. The terrain pieces should be connected to a volcano and include one of each terrain piece. And you should have at least 8 different islands. Other than that it's really freestyle. On these terrain pieces you need to put out some raw material. Clay on the shores, woods on the forests, and some initial yellow tokens with minerals on, on the mountains. This is the setup of player number two. If we look at the player eight setup card, we should look down here, where it says two. We can see that player number two should start with a goat farm and a crops farm. They should also already know the invention of a field knife. This means that we should put tokens on all of the inventions except the field knife. And we should put tokens on all on the settlement's fields except the goat and crop farm. The spaces on your board that are filled up with tokens are the ones that you have not yet learned and can't produce yet. The fields that are empty from tokens are the ones that you can produce or create. We should also take a tribe cards, looking like this. This is the name of our tribe. This is a special ability that our tribe has. This card for example lets you buy something from the market minus one of the costs, making the card cheaper. And also our starting initial goods. So here for example I should take the round tokens and put one on salt, one on fish, one on oatmeal, and one on clay. Then I need to take four villagers and put one on number four, one on five and six, and lastly one on number seven. The rest of my little villagers or nobles should be put up here. 
The rest of my tokens should be put next to the table. Last thing I need to do is to look at the setup 8 card and take the corresponding actions up here. Three cubes and one cylinder. I should put them down in my action deposit. Out here on the side of your tribe board you also have an area where you put out the resources that you have picked up from the different terrains. Of course you put them where the little token matches. Now you save these to the end of the game and they can be used as scores in a player versus player game. Some of the tribe boards have another side on the back. This is the trader side. Because you can also play in a mode where you have a trader among you. We also need to set up Mount T and Aya. Pretty much makes sense, right? It's a game about Mount T and Aya, so it should be a part of the game. First thing we need to do is to take these little cylinders here and put them on the wrath thermometers. This indicates how angry the gods are. And each god should have their own little cylinder placed on the orange square, which is the starting area. Then you need to take six of these offering cards randomly and put them face up beneath each god. The cards you see here in the middle represents the different eras you will go through and the possible disasters. You should pick one from each era with their specific difficult levels. There are three different levels, easy, medium and hard. And you should pick one card from each era with the same difficult levels that you and your crew have agreed on. So for example, like this. Put them with number 1 in the front, 2 and in the end number 3. Out here in the sides you have the different catastrophes from each god. If you're playing a competitive game and this symbol down here shows up on the event card, you need to pick a secret objective. The objective is secret so do not show them for anyone. You should take two cards and you should pick one of them. The card you pick should be placed face down on the table in front of you and the other one is not a part of the game anymore. You then also choose one of these score tokens and put them face up on the card you have just chosen. Then you take the rest of the cards and the tokens and hand them to the next player. Next to this beautiful mountain you should place all the catastrophes, all the volcanoes and also the ships that will bring those evil conquistadors to your land. I love saying that word, conquistadors. I don't even know if I pronounce it correctly, but it just sounds cool. Well, you put the dices next to them also, because each ship have their own dice. The black one have the black dice, the gray one the gray dice, and the white ship the white dice. You also put the tsunamis next to it, but also the gods themselves. Next step is to set up the wilderness. Just be aware because there's different symbols here. All depending if you're playing player versus player or co-op mode. This should match up with the one on the board on the table. Simply slide down the wilderness here and it's time for us to place some animals. We should place the amount of animals as there are players plus two. Meaning that this is a two player game so there should be four pigs and four goats. The rest of the animals goes in the reserves next to the wilderness. In a competitive game, you would put your color on the field on the other side to compete about points and becoming the one with most points. But this is a co-op game, so I'm using the other side. Here instead, we choose a mission. We choose one mission and we place it on the side over here in the wilderness. The rest of these missions are not used during this gameplay. So we have built the big board. We have put out some terrain pieces and put out resources matching with the terrain on all the pieces. We have built Mount Tindaya. We have put some animals in the wilderness and now it's time for the players to pick up their starting settlements. There's four different settlements. This one is the pig farm and this one is the fisherman. But there's also a mountain goat herd and crops. And they all need to be placed on different kinds of terrains. 
The pigs here, for example, they go on the forest terrains. Same thing with crops, they would also go on forest terrain. But the fisherman here, he will go at the shore. Makes sense, right? So the first player starts by placing his first settlement and picking up the resources on that terrain piece. Meaning that when I have placed my settlement, I will get some wood. This one means that you will get one wood per era. This is era one, so I only get one. But if it had been era two, I would get two. If it had been era three, I would get three. Plus the bonus stated next to it. This means that when I pick this one up, I get one plus one, giving me two woods. I placed it down here on my board and then I take the tokens and put them on the resource for wood. So now it's the second player's turn. They place out their terrain piece and they pick up the resources connected to the terrain piece where they place their settlement. You also need to put one cylinder at the cave spot as you only start with one cave but you can build one more. Once we have placed our initial starting settlements, we should also put out some meeples. We should put one noble, looking like this, on each settlement. Then we need to take the remaining three villagers and put them on the settlements as well. You can put these any way you want to. If you want to put all three on one or split them up, it's up to you. You take two pigs from the reserves, not the wilderness, and place on the pig farms. and. Two goats, again from the reserves, and put them on the goat farms. The noblemen here in these games are the ones that makes the things happen. They're the ones that get to do the sacrificing, they're the ones that learns the trades, they're also the ones that gets to build new settlements and do some herding. These ones are quite important. We need to shuffle the prophecy cards here and put them in front of Mount Tiendaya. And we also need to shuffle the idol cards. Now, the rules in this game are different depending on if you're playing solo, if you're playing co-op, or if you're playing player versus player. If you're playing co-op, you should remove the cards that got this star up here in the corner. This is the star representing player versus player. And the purple triangle that I showed you before, that is the symbol that shows that it's a co-op game. And this is quite important when you set up the game and when you read the rules, what you want to play. Because there is quite a big difference. We are in the last step of the setup. We need to put out some conquistadors. The way we do this is that we roll a die and then we find a volcano that has this number. Because each chasm and volcano has a number. And I had number 8 here, so I need to find the volcano with number 8. And then I need to pick a forest on that number. If there's no forest available, which there's not, I should instead choose a, cho a shore. If there's no shore, I should choose a mountain. But there is a shore here. So I need to remove the resources on this terrain piece. And then I need to place a conquistador fort. These forts are located on the backside of the terrain pieces. I put this one on the shore and then I need to put down two conquistadors on that fort. And now we are ready to start playing. Tindaya is played out during three different phases and one endgame. The first phase is the strategy phase. This is where we kind of get an idea of what, what is gonna happen and what catastrophes are about to happen. The first thing we need to do during the strategy phase is to look at the event card to see if there's any ships. On this one there's one white card. So I need to roll a die for this white ship. I will get a number, I got number one, and I need to find the chasm with number one and place the white ship on that chasm right here if there had been more ships on the event deck i would have rolled for these as well and put them out on the board ships can share the same space the story of tindaya is that we have a mother called tibanin and a daughter called tamontante 
these two can kind of see into the future and tell us what is gonna happen and where is gonna happen. But to do this, they need fire because they see their prophecies in the fire and in the ashes. So to be able to get the prophecies from these two, you need to produce fire by the end of era three. If you have managed to get all the resources, you get both prophecies. If you only manage to get one, the player that have placed the resource is the one that get to pick what prophecy we should watch. And if you don't manage to place anything there, well, you just have to guess. The good thing here is that in era number one, we always get to see both prophecies. First, we need to flip over Tipa Nin's prophecy card to see what might happen. The symbols here that corresponds with the ones on the event cards are the catastrophes that are gonna happen. Depending on what kind of catastrophe it is, it will end up on different terrain pieces. You can see under here there is a brown, which means that it will end up on a volcano. If it's blue, it's gonna end up on a chasm. Out here, you can see the number corresponding to the volcano or chasm it should be put on. So the one up here, for example, the Monibas catastrophe, she should be placed on a volcano with number two because her symbol is also on the event card. The same thing with the tsunami, it should be placed on a chasm with number three because it is on the event card. If we look at Aquan down here, he should also be placed out because he's also up on the event card. On a volcano with number 5. But the volcano down here is not on the event card, so this one should not be placed out. So Moniba goes on a mountain number 2, placing her over here. The tsunami goes on a chasm number 3, placing it over here. Here. Akoan goes on a mountain number 5 and should be placed over here. The tsunamis are placed out even if there would have been a conquistador ship on that place. Then we reveal Tamontante's prophecy by simply turning Akoan's and Moniba's cards around. Step 2 of phase 1 is where players get to sit down and discuss what they would like to do or what they would like someone else to do. And this happens even if it's not a co-op game, if it's player versus player. Because really everybody can benefit from this. We know what is heading our way. We know the catastrophes, we know where they're gonna happen. So this is a good idea to just sit down and have some kind of planning strategy on what we would like to focus on. Do we want to focus on getting some wood so we can get the fire and prophecies in the next era? Do we need to get rid of some conquistadors? What can we do to really help each other? Of course, this is just a planning step and there's no plans that ever works out completely, right? So even if the players are all game and in on it, you never really know what's going to happen in the end. So we're done with the planning and we step into phase number two. This is the action phase. This is where we actually get to do stuff on our little player board here. In the beginning, you only have your starting action tokens. The ones that you got from the player eight card, remember? But as you unlock more things on your board, you will get more and more actions. Every time you unlock a cube, for example, you will get one extra action that you can use during every phase. And they should be put down in your action resource here. But if you unlock a cylinder, you actually get to do two actions. But this is a one-timer. Once you have used it, this one is no more in the game. But like I said, to get these actions, you need to first unlock them. And you can do this in different ways. The first action is develop. The development actions will let us develop new inventions for our tribe. But to learn the inventions, we will first need to learn the trades. By default, we know how to use crops and how to farm goats. We do not know how to farm pigs or the fisherman trade. So we will not be able to develop these inventions before 
we learn these traits. To develop a new invention, we simply take our little action marker here and put it up in the development square. Now we also need to pay the goods for that invention. Once we have paid the goods needed, we get the action marker and put it in our action area. Now we know how to make cheese. And also we know how to preserve cheese. Which means that if we have three cheese here in this area, we do not have to throw it away in the end of phase 3. We also can feed two villagers. If I had used a cylinder instead of a cube in the development phase of a trade I already know, and can pay the resources, I would have been able to open two inventions at once, giving me two extra cylinders and a way of producing even more goods in future rounds. But you can also produce, which is the hand symbol. To do this, you simply take your little action marker here and you put it up on the hand symbol. But remember that cylinders was actually two actions instead of one, meaning that this player here could produce some milk as their first action, but then they could use a second action to get some horns and meat as well. The way you would get these products is by by looking at the symbols up here. This means that I get one milk for every goat that I have in my goat settlements that are under my control. I have two goats out on the map right now, so on my first production, remember this is a double production, I would get two milk. And on my second production, I will also get two milk. But now I can choose to slaughter my sheep. And if I choose to slaughter both my sheep, I would get two horns and two meat. But I could also choose to just slaughter one sheep. But then I would of course get one goods less. So this is how production goes on. Up here you have a little symbol showing you what you need to be able to produce this good. Fix, for example, shows a little villager. Which means that you get one fig for every villager that you have out on the map. If you want some meat, you need to slaughter pigs. For every pig you slaughter, you get meat. It's kind of basic, actually. What makes this hard is that you have so many choices and so many steps to produce that you sometimes get a little bit confused. And you also need to have a good strategy on what you want to make. What do you need? That's where this game gets a bit harder. Also, at the end of era 3 you have a garbage step, which means that you need to throw away everything that gets old. Because food gets old, and if you throw away food, the gods will get really really mad at you. So it's a good thing that you create vessels. The vessels are the ones down here. This is where you can create, for example, salted meat or salted fish, and save it for later. But the vessels only have a certain amount of space. And that space can be seen up here in the left corners of the vessels. You can see it says 3, which means that you get to keep 3. But everything above 3 will be thrown in the garbage. And then we have movements. And movements are actually quite simple in this game. You simply take your little action marker here and you put it on the feet symbol up on your tribe board. This will grant you 3 movements on the board. If you would have put a cylinder there, you would have three moves plus three moves. And you can move on land really any way you want to go. You can bring as many villagers or nobles with you as you want to as well. And you can drop them off any way you want to as well. Which means that I could take these two, move one one step, move the other one another step, and then I can go out into the sea as well. But I would need to pay one wood to build a canute. With this, I can travel over the sea, but only in straight lines. But I can go as long as I would want to. With this canoe, I can bring up to five meeples with me on my journey. But I don't need to bring all of them. I could only bring two, for example, and take them with me to the other side. Just remember that you need to end your last movement on a terrain tile. 
I ended my movement on a terrain tile with resources on, so I can pick these up, giving me the resources stated on the back, and putting it right down in my deposit. If you end up on a tile with another tribe, you can choose to barter as well, as long as you both agree. But you should share the same amount of goods. So saying that you give one to two woods, you should get two of something back. And there are no giveaways here, so you don't get anything for free. You can't give another player five woods and not getting anything back. If a player ends their movement on a volcano with a noble, they can choose to sacrifice some villagers. Or sacrifice some conquistadors from the prison. They can even choose to sacrifice themselves. So the gods are some greedy bastards and they want your stuff. When you are located on a volcano, you can give them what they want by simply paying offerings from your supplies. But we need to look at what era we are in. Because depending on what era you're in, they want different stuff and more stuff. So we are in era 1 and we should look at the fields where era 1 is stated. Taking whatever they want from your supply, for example fix, and paying by the amount of players. So if this had been a one player game, it would only have been one fig. But this is a two player game, so we need to give them two. Placing them on the field. Now we're making the gods a little bit happier. Each of these offering cards grants one idol card to the first player to place resources on them. These cards will give you a lot of cool benefits. So when you move into an empty terrain, you get to take the resources like I said before, but you also get the opportunity to build a new settlement that fits on this terrain type. And to be able to build it, you need to know this trade. My people, for example, they knew how to fish and they also knew how to do pig farms at the start. But for example, to be able to place a crops here, I need to learn this trade. To learn this trade I need to end up my movement with a noble on a settlement that has a villager or a noble from another tribe that already knows this trade. In the end of phase number three I will automatically learn this trade if I stand on this settlement with the tribe that knows the trade. From now on I will be able to build these settlements myself, as long as I use a noble. If you're on a settlement with no animals and you have a noble there, you can choose to herd animals, two from the wilderness. And you can do this even if you have just made this settlement. If a villager enters a terrain with conquistadors, they need to end their step there and initiate a battle. Only nobles are able to start an attack. So you can't go into attack with only a villager. You would need to have a noble with you. You can win this attack if you are the same amount of conquistadors and each villagers have a weapon. The conquistadors will go directly to the jail on your tribe board. If the player does not win, they can still choose to use as many weapons as they would like to, to try to kill as many conquistadors as possible. In the action phase, you can also choose to play one of your idol cards, if they have the action symbol. The lightning here means that this card can be played during the action phase. Then there are the event phase and there are the end phase as well. You can also choose to sacrifice one of your idols to get resources instead. Or you can buy from the market. From the market you can buy idol cards, you can buy walls or vessels if you pay the amount stated above. That was the end of phase number two. Now we move into phase number three. This is the end of era phase. And this is where things are getting a little bit steamy. Because the first step in the end of era phase is the reproduction phase. Which means that Every settlement that has two villagers will reproduce, adding another villager to 
that settlement. The same thing goes for the places that has two animals. They also reproduce. And the conquistadors reproduce as well. As long as there's more than two, because you need two to make a baby, right? And the same thing happens in the wilderness as well. Once we're done with the breeding, we come to the feeding step. Now we need to feed our villagers, not our nobles. They will feed themselves. We can quick and easy see how many villagers we have out on the map by simply look at the numbers here. Right now we need to feed four villagers. And as you can see here, each villager needs one portion. If we look at our deposits, we can see small hearts with numbers in them. Each heart represents the number of portions that this is. This has a number three, so this one will feed three villagers. This one has number two, so it will feed two villagers. And now we have to check if we have any food left on our trade board that unfortunately will go old and we have to throw to the garbage. These two here are placed on a goods with the garbage symbol. So these are thrown away. The ones down here, they are in the vessel. And this vessel can contain up to three goods. So these are actually good. The goods that we need to throw away are placed on the garbage symbol in the wilderness. This place here can contain up to the amount of players. So if we exceed this amount, we need to raise the wrath of the gods. This time raising the wrath of Akron. You start out your game with one cave that can shelter four villagers. But if you at this point have not built the second cave and you have more than four villagers out on the map, they will die. And then we also have to raise the wrath of Moniba. We need to check with the gods if we have delivered the goods that they wanted. If we have, for example, with Akron over here, we actually lower his wrath by one. But if we have not, like Moniba over here, we need to raise her wrath by one. We have entered the event step. This is where the wrath of the gods are unleashed on us and there's no turning back. We need to resolve these events according to the steps here, starting with Moniba. Depending on how high the wrath of the god is, they will have a different radius. If they're at the lowest level, the yellow level, it will only affect the closest terrains. But if we are on a high level, we will go further and further out, affecting bigger areas. What the gods will do to you really depends on what the cards are showing. There's a lot of horrible ways to die here from the gods. But these ones, they were the cards that Timotante revealed in the beginning of the game, if you have the fire or if you are in era 1. So it really makes a big difference if you know what's going to happen on these cards because some of them, yeah, might not even be that bad to you and some of them you really do not want to be nearby. Tsunamis will flush everything away within the radios, including the terrain pieces themselves. But if you have a villager on top of a volcano, they are not in danger as they are elevated. If a volcano erupts, everything with iron dead radios will also have to go away, as well they probably burn to death. But if there's any forest or shore terrain, they should be flipped over and become volcanic rocks instead, and put a mineral on top of them. So it's not all bad. Once we're done with the disasters from the god, we move into the disasters from the human being, the conquistadors. Now we need to determine which island they will try to conquer, and they will move to the closest one. If there is a tie, they will pick the one with most settlements on them. If there's still a tie, they will take the one with the most natives on them. If there's still a tie, well the priority player will decide which island it will attack. The conquistadors will attack settlements. If there are no settlements, they will attack the terrain instead. But there are two settlements here, and there will be two conquistadors per settlement. But let's say that this settlement had a wall to defend them. 
Then the conquistadors would flee right away without anything affecting this settlement. But if there instead had just been an empty settlement, we would have turned this one into a fort instead, with two conquistadors. And if it's occupied, a battle will take place. If there are multiple battles going on on the island, you need to resolve them one by one. But you can still use idle cards to repel the conquistadors and let them flee away. But you, to win, you need to meet two conditions. You need to have two natives in the settlements and you need to use two weapons. If you win the battle, you get to put the conquistadors in jail. If you do not manage to protect your settlement, well, you put your little figure back in the reserves and the conquistadors will build a fort there. We've done the natural disasters, we've done the conquistadors, we've done battles. Now it's time to see if we are still alive. We need to check survival. If the players have at least one villager and one noble alive, we are still in the game. If not, eh, well, too bad. If the Wrath have leveled up to the maximum Wrath level, we are all dead. But it's not. We're still fine. I mean, we still have one more left. No worries, right? Do you remember the fire I told you about at the beginning of the game? The fire that the mom and daughter needed to actually see their prophecies? Well, now it's the time to contribute to get this fire going. Because we're moving into era number two, and we won't get these prophecies for free again. You only get them for free in number one. So if we want to know what's gonna happen and where it's gonna happen during the next era, we need to get this fire going. And we need to contribute with resources. We do this simply by placing one of our little markers on the hand. To get this fire going, we need manure, wood, or some hay. The last step in phase number three is the maintenance area. This is where we remove any action markers that we have still on our board. We get rid of the cylinders that we have used, because remember, they can't be used again. We place the little squares here, the action markers, the squares one, down in our deposit our action deposit we remove any tokens that shouldn't be in the wilderness for example or on the offering board we also need to change the event card from era number one to era number two because we step into a new era now we also need to remove the catastrophic cards from the gods and having this side up we do not turn them over yet remember we haven't fulfilled the prophecy yet we need to come into the new era first. So how do we know that we succeeded? Well, there are some conditions and it really depends on if you're playing co-op or if you're playing player versus player. But if we say co-op, there are some conditions that need to be met. You need to have at least one noble and a villager alive. You need to control at least one settlement. And the wrath of the god are not allowed to be at the max level. Remember, if that happens, we all did. And we also need to be in control of our own land. If we are in control of our land, we need to check out the scheme here in the wilderness. We are two players and we have nine villagers and nobles out on the playing field. So we can't have more than eight conquistadors on the map. If we have more than eight, we have failed. If we have eight or less, we have control. We also need to check the missions here that we all picked up in the beginning of the game. If we meet these conditions, well, we have won. But if you play in competitive mode, you of course need to check out the competitive side of the wilderness to see who's in the lead. And now you need to calculate how many nobles you have, what kind of goods do you have, settlements, secret objectives, calculate them all together and in the end, you will have a winner.
So there you have it people, that was Tindaya for you. This is a game of epic proportions. There's so many things for you to do in this game. There's so many things for you to create. There's settlements to take over. There's conquistadors to battle. You need to please the gods. You need to figure out how to stay out of all these big disasters that happens around you. There's a lot of components and there's a lot of things for you to create. You can create weapons, you can create food, build shelters, move your little figures around the board. This is an awesome, awesome game. And the different modes as well. You can play solo, you can play co-op, you can play competitive. There's even a trader mode in here where there's just one player you can't trust that much. And I haven't even showed you that. This game is absolutely crazy. I love it. And I dare to say that this could be the game of 2022. I mean, we're not even in 2022 yet. I'm recording this in 2021 and I still have already believe that this game could be a competitor for that spot. It's just that good. I mean, it's on the heavy side. I'm not gonna lie. The setup, first time I set it up, it took me around 40-45 minutes. The second time it took me around 30 minutes. So the setup is huge. But the gameplay is well worth it. I just love spending hours in this world. Also, the rules, I mean, the rules are not that hard because they pretty much make sense. The only thing is that there's a lot of rules and there's a lot of different things for you to be able to do in this game. And that's what makes this game on the heavier side. The rules themselves are really not that complicated. It's just that there's so many of them. But for me, it doesn't really matter because that gives the game just some extra flavor and makes sure that the game will last for years and years and not become boring. If you want to read more about this game, people, there will be a link down here in the description. So check it out, read on it. If you feel like this is something for you, check it out. There will be a Kickstarter next year. I am absolutely sure that this game will be found founded because it's just that awesome and it's already have a lot of buzz around it so check it out if you want to know more if you like my video please comment on it please give me a thumbs up or just communicate with me tell me something i'd love to just talk to you i love this community because there's so much love in the board gaming community and i want you to keep on spreading that love Keep on teaching other people how to play. Keep on reaching out those hands and get those new players in and get them on the table and learn them how to play. That's the beauty of all of this. If you like my channel and if you like my videos, please hit the subscribe button. I love to have you hanging around. It gives me a smile on my lips every time I get a new subscriber. Until next time, people, please take care of each other. Peace.